As we're going through the book of Romans, it's important for us to keep in mind the historical context of the book. You know, we don't do that very well in this day and age, where it seems our history is being rewritten, even changed, stories actually removed from history and statues torn down, famous men being scrubbed from the pages of history. We're very poor students of history, or we don't really appreciate history the way we should. In fact, I have some answers some students put on their essay test describing history. They're actually hilarious, but a little bit sad. Actual answers given on history exams, both Bible history and secular history, either in high school or in college. Moses led the Hebrew slaves to the Red Sea, where they made unleavened bread, which is bread without any ingredients. Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. He died before he ever reached the land of Canada. Solomon had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. The Greeks were a highly sculptured people, and without them, we wouldn't have history. The Greeks also had many myths. A myth is a female moth. Ancient Egypt was inhabited by mummies, and they all rode in hydraulics. They lived out in the Sahara Desert and traveled by Camelot. Socrates was a famous Greek teacher who went around giving people advice. That's what killed him. He died from an overdose of wedlock. In the Olympic Games, Greeks ran races, jumped and hurled the biscuits, and threw the java. Eventually, the Romans conquered the Greeks. History calls the people Romans because they never stayed in one place very long. Julius Caesar extinguished himself on the battlefield of Gaul, but he was killed by his friends because they thought he was trying to be king. As he was dying, he said these words, Tihi, Brutus. Nero was a cruel tyrant who would torture his subjects by playing the fiddle to them. It was the age of great inventions and discoveries. Gutenberg invented the Bible. Another invention was the circulation of blood. Sir Walter Raleigh is an historical figure because he invented cigarettes and started smoking. The greatest writer of the Renaissance was William Shakespeare. He was born in the year 1654, supposedly on his birthday. He wrote tragedies, comedies, and hysterectomies. Another great author was John Milton. Milton wrote Paradise Lost. Then his wife died, and he wrote Paradise Regained. Abraham Lincoln became America's greatest president. Lincoln's mother died in her infancy, and Lincoln was born in a log cabin that he built with his own hands. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves by signing the Emasculation Proclamation. On the night of April 14, 1865, Lincoln went to the theater and got shot in his seat by one of the actors in a moving picture show. The believed assassinator was John Wilkes Booth, an insane actor. This ruined Booth's career. I'm sure those of you who teach college and high school, you have to laugh at, at this because you know people just don't have a good grasp of history. I want to remind you of the historical context in Romans, the third chapter. Paul grew up in the Jewish religion. He was an expert on it. For many years, he served as the chief prosecutor and persecutor of Christianity. He went around making sure Christians were put to death. Then he was converted and he became a Christian. And instead of being a prosecutor of Christianity, he became the greatest defender of the Christian faith. In chapter 1, Paul talks about how a man without any kind of religious background, pagan Gentiles, are terribly sinful. That's what chapter 1 is all about. And as he was writing those words, I'm sure the Jewish Christians in Rome were saying, That's right, Paul. Give it to them, those terrible old Gentile pagan people. Then in chapter 2, he really comes down hard on religious people about those who are trusting in a Jewish religion, or in our case, a Protestant religion, or an evangelical religion, or a Catholic religion. And he aims his big guns 
at religion. In chapter 3, he synthesizes the two and is trying to make a definite point. Look at the ninth verse. He brings his conclusion to light. What shall we conclude then? Are we Jews any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. That's the point he's been trying to make, and he's going to develop it in the next few chapters. Having said all that, in the preceding eight verses, the Apostle Paul does something a little unusual. Because he has a brilliant legal mind, as he's defending Christianity, he also steps into the role of people who have objections to Christianity. People who have objections against believing all people are sinners and they need a savior. The Apostle Paul anticipates all the questions, presents the objections, even people today make about their sinful condition and overrules the objections. That's why the title of this series is Objection Overruled. Next week, we're gonna begin looking at the first of those objections and the ruling of the heavenly Supreme Court. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Romans and for the Apostle Paul and for the, the work that he does explaining what a relationship with God means, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to have Jesus Christ in your heart. Lord, that all of us are sinful and need a Savior. And I pray, Lord, that we would look during this series carefully at our own lives in Jesus' name.